I want to welcome our first speaker for this session. Um, she's the executive director of the Latino Health Access Center, a center for health promotion and disease prevention in Santa Ana, California. Please welcome America, Dr. America Bracho. Good morning. It's a true honor to be here today with all of you, sharing some of the thoughts and some of the activities that, uh, that we developed in California. Um, I am originally from Venezuela, where I practiced medicine for several years in rural Venezuela. I remember um, being there in our little clinic and seeing a lot of these diseases that are part of the books of tropical medicine. But in reality, they are not tropical diseases, but diseases of poverty. I was there day in and day out um, trying to fight diseases that were caused by dirty water or lack of water or plain poverty. But I also was exposed during my time in Venezuela to working with community workers, with what we call in Spanish promotoras, promotoras de salud. And in Venezuela, they were called nurse assistants. These promotoras were women that lived in those communities and were able to create great, amazing relationships with other families in the community. Their strategy for immunizations included the creation of relationships with those mothers. Those mothers were their friends, their comadres, they were their neighbors. So talking about vaccines was not just a transaction, but was part of a relationship. And I learned with these promotores and these community workers and this community how to work with very little resources, but a lot of creativity. After that, I decided to go to Michigan to do public health and really learn more about how to help our communities. And in Michigan, in the School of Public Health, I learned that in addition to germs and viruses and genetic codes, there are a bunch of other things that can make you sick. And they are called social determinants of health. I learned that your housing arrangements can make you sick. The lack of information and the lack of education, the environment, that poverty makes you sick, that discrimination can make you sick that racism makes you sick. I learned that health is not the absence of disease, but it is a state of wellness, of physical, social, and mental wellness. And I also learned that yes, we need equality, and yes, we need services with quality, but we need equity. We need the resources and opportunities that can help us take advantage of resources and opportunities. Otherwise, we will continue creating technologies not, that nobody can use. And ideas and concepts about prevention that communities cannot implement. In 1993, we created Latino Health Access, the organization that I direct in Santa Ana. And uh, our theory of change was the following. If we provide services to the community, and we use those services as an entry door for participation, people will participate because our community cares. That was an assumption, and we believe deeply on that. And we thought that if they participate, then we can have more services and more people will participate. But if after that we could have conversations with community members, we could come up with ideas and strategies that we all, together as a collective, could implement and then have healthier communities. Our first program was the diabetes program, the diabetes management program that we still have, and we have many other programs in disease prevention and health promotion. 
During our diabetes program, I remember, and I started this, it was just the beginning of Latino Health Access, and I remember having classes where people would talk about their personal problems a lot as a, as a, as a barrier to managing their diabetes. And I'm talking about having people talking about glucose and then say, how are you expecting for me to control this? You know, my kid was uh, expelled from schools, or my husband lost his job, or I I'm about to be evicted from my uh, house and I might end up living in a garage. I don't have money to buy food, and I don't have money to buy medications, or I don't have medical care. I mean, it was like, okay, we are talking about glucose and pancreas, and we are surrounded by this reality that we couldn't hide, and we didn't want to hide. So we went on and said, well, what is going on? What is going on? Where are these participants coming from? So we took the list and saw that they were coming from this place. They were coming from the 92701 zip code in Orange County, the second poorest zip code in the county and one of the poorest zip codes in California. And not just from the zip code, from certain neighborhoods in that zip code. The only classes that we had were the classes on diabetes, and we decided to recruit community workers out of that class. You know, we saw the people that were more committed, the people that wanted to, to that they wanted our jobs. They just wanted to be there and be part of the solution. We hired them and paid them and gave them health insurance. And some of them continue working in the diabetes classes, and some of them became the community health workers or promotores in the 92701 zip code. I remember particularly Adela, one of our promotoras, and her intensity and commitment to reach everyone in those neighborhoods. And in doing that, Adela met Soledad. Soledad was a neighbor, and she met many neighbors, but Soledad particularly was a very interesting neighbor because she wanted to help, but she had a lot of barriers uh, in her mind, and Adela insisted, and then Soledad accepted. And Soledad joined Adela in reaching other neighbors. Later on, we recruited Soledad as community worker. And after recruiting her and giving her a job, we learned that Soledad was being a victim of domestic violence. And Soledad always shares with us that the last time her husband hit her was one week after she had a job with us. And it was his last time, because now she had a paycheck. And she was able to move with her kids to another place. But we couldn't help Soledad that much with her need for healing. You know, I mean, we were her friends and we were supporting her, but she needed healing. And she said, I need to go to a place, and there is not a single place in Orange County where women like me can go and receive help and support. Can I think about something that maybe we can offer? And we said, well, think about something. Make a proposal. So Soledad created the first support groups in mental health in Spanish for our community. And life went on. Then we created other programs, including uh, programs on leadership for youth and children. Latino Health Access has a very um, uh, important programs that include uh, youth as leaders, and a children promotor program. Our youngest promotor is six. Our oldest promotor is 78. And these little kids go home by home, knocking at doors and telling people that conflict is okay, but violence is not. And they are asking people to count to 10 and breathe before reacting, and then they say, thank you, and they go to the next house. They also go and say that apples are better than pizzas, although people like me prefer pizzas. You should give us more apples, thank you. <laughs> so we are having this army of uh, promotores, and I remember that within, within our Work on Children initiative, we met another person that is a promotora now, but back then was just a mom, and her name is Sarai. And Sarai came with four kids, two kids with disabilities, and also living in a situation of domestic violence, and very happy that she had a place where to leave her kids. 
Sarai later on joined as a volunteer, like Soledad did, and then joined as a pay staff in Latino Health Access. Sarai said, I don't have a place that can help me with my kids, with my kids with disabilities. And she went on to create the first group for parents with kids with disabilities uh, that is called the I Exist group to do advocacy for the rights of kids with disabilities. But later on, Sarai joined our policy department. Latino Health Access has all of these programs on disease prevention and health promotion, but also a policy arm, because if we don't change policies, we will not be able to change things in long term. And long term is important. Short term is important, but long term is extremely important as well. She joined and received training and we were able to start advocating for open spaces and safety and talking with the police. And after 11 years of fight and finding resources, we were able to create the first park and community center in the 92701 zip code. We were able to learn from the community what else was going on, you know, the issues of housing. Orange County, in Orange County, recent data says that if you make minimum salary in Orange County, you will need to work 120 hours a week to afford one bathroom apartment. 120 hours per week you need to work. And we ask ourselves, how come these parents are not participating in schools? And how come they are not coming to our appointments on time? And how come without knowing that they need to work 120 hours? And if they work less hours, we say, that's why they are poor, they are pretty lazy. So these are the situations in Orange County. But you know, together with foundations and other groups and the community, we have been able to create a collective that is fighting together. And it's a collective, a collective, and we don't take credit for many of the things that are happening because when you work in collectives, you cannot take credit. But we are doing together pretty amazing things. We have been able to uh, gain affordable housing some units, not as many as we need, but some. We have been able to gain some open spaces and some that are about to open now, some, some parks in, in some schools. Uh, we were able to mobilize the community to inform the strategic plan of the city of Santa Ana, where we are, we have our voice saying that you as a city have the obligation to budget and invest in communities that have been chronically neglected. But now we have a voice that is getting more and more organized. And we were able actually to propose few things in that strategic plan that got approved. Lately, the community has been able to create a resolution. They proposed and fought for all of this year in a resolution to create job opportunities, to create a market in Santa Ana where low-income people can sell things and benefit from the economic growth in Orange County. Not just buy in the store of people that are making money, but actually selling and making some money. And we propose a market. We also propose micro farms where people can grow food, eat fresh food, share fresh food, and sell fresh food. And we also propose the inclusion of residents from those communities in the economic development committees that until now only have had people from the business community, the official business community, as if people that actually clean houses or sell enchiladas or sell tamales are not business people. And we were able to push and push and push and create partnerships within city council and we got the approval for the market. We got the approval to include the community in these committees and we got the approval to get the land for the micro farms. We are far from actually making that a reality because you know that between approval and doing it, there are a lot of politics. And this is where if you are not at the table, those things don't get done. We are collaborating at the state level, also as a collective, and as a collective with groups like the California Center for Public Health Advocacy, we were able a few years ago to take sodas out of the schools. And now we are fighting to get the warning labels in those bottles of soda 
not an easy task to fight with against the soda companies, but we are getting more organized and we are getting stronger. In the meantime, in the meantime, while we do all of this collective work, promotoras continue doing what they know how to do. They are outreaching people, going, finding our neighbors, our women, our men, our children, and inviting them to participate, inviting them to access services, talking to them, creating relationships. They are creating spaces where we can get to know each other more, where those relationships can get deeper, and then we can talk about the things that we need to talk. We can have the difficult conversations about our personal lives, about violence, about our responsibility, but also about community change and our role in community transformation. We also are providing services, Promotora provides services. They are the ones teaching the healthy weight programs, the diabetes classes, the mental health programs. And they are creating mechanisms for participation so people can bring their own voice to the table, not just be represented by another person just because they don't speak English. Many institutions and groups invite us to have these conversations. How do we get promotoras? How do we get, com we get communities to participate more? And we love when they do that. But we, we take it as a responsibility to ask difficult questions. Why do you want to have promotoras or community workers? So they can do what you say? So you can pay less than you pay to a nurse? Why do you want to have promotores? Do you want to hire these experts and then tell them what to do or are you ready to engage them as experts and let them be part of the thinking table that can inform your strategies? We need to have those difficult conversations in our engagement with, with communities. We have learned many, many things uh, with our work with community workers, with community partners, not only in Latino Health Access and California, but throughout the world, because promotoras and community workers are everywhere. The grandmothers of Nepal, the many promotoras in Ethiopia and Africa and India and Mexico and Colombia and certainly the United States. We have learned many things. We have learned that we need to organize our voice and our voice need to be loud but they organize. We have learned that our communities have a lot of needs, but needs do not change communities. Needs do not change communities. Our strengths, our passions, our talents change communities because with them, we can address the needs. So engaging people because their needs means that we assume that we have the strength and they have the needs, and that is not the right way of engaging in a respectful way our community. We have learned that power comes out of the conviction that you can do this. In Spanish, power is, is the same word that can in English. I can means we say yo puedo, yo puedo de poder. And power is that conviction que yo puedo, that I can do this. I can have a better family, I can have a better community, my kids can graduate. This is, this is the conviction of power. But we also know that there is this other power, the power that people in government have, that people in institutions have, the power to change policies, make policies, assign budgets. And we know that we cannot have better and healthier communities ignoring the political power. We know, we know for sure that long time ago when we created institutions, because institutions were not born before people, people were born before institutions. We created institutions and institutions learn to work without communities and communities learn to operate without influencing these institutions. So it's almost like we unlearn to participate and have to relearn to participate. But we also have to unlearn what we think is true about communities. We need to unlearn that knowledge and those practices that are not helping. We need to find a way of just getting rid of that. We need to unlearn the way we are approaching community work and learn new ways that are aligned with the values that we hold today. 
We have this story in Latinos of Access. We say that the first promotora ever in the planet was a cave woman. And that in her cave, she learned, she discovered fire. And since then, like her, promotoras have been sharing the fire. We believe at the end that the real power is in sharing our fire. Thank you so much.